This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. And so because of that, I'm going to present in English, and I apologize for that. Uh, but I, first of all, I want to thank Professors Berger and Ben Simon for the in, invitation to come here this afternoon. Thank everyone who's here, because I know it's a very busy time of year between marking and finishing. Uh, so... Uh, and I will try to speak clearly, but if I'm not understandable, flag me down and uh, ask me to be more clear. Uh, and I apologize, I'm going to read, otherwise we'll be here for days. <laughs> so, um, ship's fireman Ula Rossi landed in the United Kingdom at Plymouth from the SS Incala in June 1925 and was duly registered as a colored alien seaman, although he was from Calcutta, which means he was a British subject. His last sea voyage ended in October 1928, however, and after that he worked ashore most of the time between then and 1931. Since 1928, he had supported himself, and I'm quoting, and I'm not going to do that all the time. Uh, he had supported himself by selling goods, silk, scarves, ties, etc., in marketplaces and peddling with similar goods. Since 1930, Rusted had also operated 16 Elder Street in Whitechapel, a very poor type of lodging house, that's a quote from a Home Office official, for his compatriots, also housing his common law wife and children and two other mixed couples. Rusted's story contains many features common to colonized workers in interwar Britain. Most arrived as seafarers, and some, like Ula Rasid, made a relatively permanent transition to work and life ashore. Such work as they could find normally consisted of marginal occupations, such as peddling and street vending, sometimes interspersed with sea voyages. A minority married and founded families. Even fewer amassed sufficient capital through makeshift occupations, like peddling, to establish more substantial businesses such as boarding houses. This paper will reconstruct the discontinuous and makeshift means whereby colonized working men survived in Britain, focusing on the 1920s and 1930s. Tens of thousands of colonized seafarers served in the British Mercantile Marine in the 19th and 20th centuries, amounting to a about a third of the maritime labor force. Um, the vast majority at colonial wage levels under draconian and unsalubrious labor conditions, enriching the maritime industry. Only a few thousand disembarked in Britain, that we know of, where they could seek work with union-sanctioned wage levels and working conditions. Although scholars are aware that this population moved to and from, into and around Britain in the North Sea and Atlantic littoral, we still know little about where they stayed or how they survived. And you'll hear a lot of detail. I, I'm going to mention birthplaces, dates, things that may seem extraneous. They're still in here because I'm still trying to work out what the patterns are. So I'll, I'll ditch them, uh, hopefully, uh, out of the oral presentation. Uh, we still know very, uh, very little about this population. Migration routes and networks span the globe, linking India, Africa, and Arabia to Britain and continental Europe. Analysis will show, and to the Americas for that matter, analysis will show that South Asians, Arabs, Africans, and other colonized working men followed indirect routes to, around, through, and beyond Britain, illustrating how men subordinated in colonial labor markets use strategic flexibility to get a livelihood in a crisis-ridden global system. This paper will begin to sketch in how such men arriving in Britain via diverse and discontinuous routes survived by moving in and out of maritime employment, supplementing or replacing maritime labor with occupations on shore. Like Ula Rasid, globally mobile men found their movements within Britain further shaped by the availability of specific types of work and other subsistence activities. Which go into the, what those were. As Rasid's story illustrates, disadvantage and discrimination in local labor markets apparently limited the types of work most could get. Colonized migrants in Britain compensated for their constrained occupational choices by moving from job to job, town to town, and occupation to occupation, as well as between formal and informal economic activity. 
The rich literature on informal economies in the developing world has not been matched by attention to similar processes in Europe. But feminist historians have described how poor women compensated for their economic disadvantage through what they call economies of makeshift, involving paid and unpaid labor within and outside the household, as well as pawning, scrounging, and semi-legal activities. And those who have read Ellen Ross's work might uh, know of that. Drawing on a web of personal relationships, including children, neighbors, and others. And this idea of makeshift seemed to me to be one way of understanding how colonized men also survived, because it seems that they, too, um, relied, historically relied on entre entrepreneurial activity to evade labor market discrimination and exploitation. Similarly, they drew on collective resources, including compatriot networks, social capital, uh, pooled, pooling capital with other migrants, a guaranteed customer base consisting of other migrants, uh, credit and co-ethnic and family labor. Colonized men seeking a living in interwar Britain coping with structural inequality and labor market disadvantage exacerbated by global depression seem to have used similar economies of makeshift. Now migration between colonies and metropoles, of course, uh, partook of specific power relations and economic arrangements, yet it also formed part of a broader and unprecedented population mobility between 1800 and 1850. Right? Restrictions on this migration began with Britain in 1905, curtailing the massive global population movements of the previous half century, which of course included massive European migration to the Americas. Uh, not, not as much from France as from Germany and Britain and some other places. The Great War, 1914 to 18, resulted from an exacerbated national defensiveness and economic instability that only deepened afterwards, especially in Britain. Yet it also mobilized colonized subjects into the war effort, drawing many to Europe where some of them remained or returned after demobilization. Of course, seamen are mobile by trade, and so many such men had no intention of settling permanently in Britain. By the 1920s, however, seafaring had become less reliable, enhancing the appeal of or necessity for alternative work. Indian and other colonized workers labored in British harbors, mines, quarries, steelworks, and ironworks. Few scholars have queried, much less investigated, their apparent absence from dockside occupations such as tugboatmen, stevedores, dockers, or warehousemen, uh, which were the common resort of white, sometimes, seafarers. And so there seems to have been some, some discrimination operating there, but no one has really looked into it. In part intimidated by Native workers' complaints about unfair competition and undercutting, as it was called, working for lower wages, many Indian and Arab migrants in particular turned to trade operating coffee houses, boarding houses, and most commonly peddling. Despite its marginality, petty trade apparently appealed to many migrants, perhaps due to the independence it afforded. And this is true of migrants in other places, Italian migrants in the United States, for example. Financially tenuous but entrepreneurial, petty capitalism freed migrants from direct supervision, acrimonious competition with indigenous workers and labor market discrimination. Scholarly debates about colonized men in Britain turn on whether men resorted to peddling or other work ashore only when they were stranded and couldn't get uh, maritime work, or as some authorities alleged, and we'll hear their voices this afternoon, traveled to Britain with the goal of peddling. Uh, so evidence at hand enables testing whether men of different origins pursued discrete survival strategies in the interwar years or responded pragmatically in the European context. Scholars, and I'm thinking of Gopalan Balachandran in particular, describe how South Asians acquired autonomy and sophistication from their occupational mobility, developing collective and individual strategies of survival qualities arguably shared by other colonized migrants and seafarers. Most uh, of, the, of the people that I'm looking at differed from classic sojourners. And the, of course, the classic work on sojourners is the Chinese laundrymen, uh, the study of Chinese laundrymen in, in Chicago. 
um, uh, most of the men I'm looking at differed from the Chinese laundrymen uh, or other sojourners because they didn't necessarily spend their entire working lives distant from home and family, which is the kind of tragedy that runs through the, uh, the work uh, on, the, on the laundrymen. Rather, many of the men I'm looking at used maritime employment as a means to circulate between their homes and more lucrative if makeshift occupations in Britain. Uh, and here I'm quoting uh, C.H. Harding, a police officer with the Cardiff City Police uh, in 1930. He said, of the Adenese, uh, of whom there were many in, in, in Britain. Men amass a sum of money and then return to their place of nativity to embark upon other methods of obtaining a livelihood. So they moved back and forth. Analysis will show seafaring and work on shore both formed part of individual men's economies of makeshift as well as collective kin and compatriot strategies based on pooling resources. Is there a question? If there's a question or if I'm going too fast or going too slow or anything, just do what my students do and create a disruption. So I, I want to talk about the source base for this. Due to the frustrations of finding evidence about colonized people and conventional, col uh, conventional colorblind sources, very few British sources indicate um, uh, any kind of racial assignment. American sources always do. Uh, British sources never do, and I've not worked with French sources to know whether they do or not. Uh, and so scholars have a very difficult time uh, looking at standard demographic sources like censuses, determining, you know, learning anything about race, right? So and they've often turned to documentation about well-publicized racial or cultural conflicts that have rendered otherwise hidden migrants visible, so riots, newspaper accounts of riots, trials, uh, which sets up a kind of conflict model that may not be as productive as it could be. Um, so, well, what other types of sources can a scholar use to get a better sense of daily life, of the, uh, of the, the 90 or 95 or 99 percent of time when people are not in conflict? Absent intensive field work in every city in Britain, which I hope will happen <laughs> eventually, a preliminary database, uh, I, I've compiled a preliminary database from national level records to start to at least kind of make a skeleton maybe of what's going on. Uh, data about colonized individuals and networks in Britain can be found in hundreds of application files for a document called the Special Certificate of Nationality and Identity. Um, this was a document that was developed uh, out of the misnamed Colored Alien Seamen Order of 1925. Um, Colored Alien Seamen Order, uh, which was not a piece of legislation but was a policy, uh, developed in 1925, continued, and finally was uh, repealed in the 1940s after the beginning of the war. Uh, the British state sought to maintain colonized seafarers' disadvantage, thus profitability, through excluding them from the British labor market and in turn from Britain. But Due to men's relentless and creative resistance against this misnamed policy because most of them were British subjects or otherwise um, British protected, uh, protectorate subjects. Due to massive resistance, uh, uh, in the 1930s the British state developed this document called the Special Certificate of Nationality and Identity, which essentially functioned as a second class passport. They didn't want to give them passports because that would undermine what they were trying to do with the Colored Alien Seaman Order, but the Colored Alien Seaman Order was creating su such a problem that they tried to sort of put a, a plaster or a band-aid on it uh, by coming up with this document, much like U.S. immigration policy. Um, so uh, this document uh, generated paperwork. And so the, there are about, about 300 applications for this document. And going through them, um, uh, I've, I've tried to construct what men were doing uh, to survive in Britain if, if they weren't seafaring. So uh, 
with, with the invocation of the, of the Colored Alien Seaman Order in 1925, men who had sometimes lived in Britain for decades, some of them had arrived before the war, uh, were increasingly called upon to provide themselves with this document. And so it also makes a picture of, of uh, a policy that was developed to control actually a fairly small, uh, a fairly defined group of people bleeding out and starting to affect all sorts of other people it was never intended to affect, which again is very often what a consequence of policy. So leaving, uh, so um, the purpose of it, of course, was to maintain colonized men's vulnerability in the maritime labor force, even if they were living in Britain. Leaving aside the moral and ethical questions about this, the procedure for getting this credential generated useful documentation about the hundreds of men who applied for it. First, a man seeking a certificate sent an application form either to the High Commissioner for India, who was responsible for uh, South Asian subjects and also Middle Eastern subjects, and in this case, a very large, the largest population were Yemenis. Uh, or else the colonial office who are responsible for all the other colonies. I imagine most people know that here if you're a British uh, historian. So the man who wanted the certificate sent the certificate to the high commissioner of the colonial office, and the high commissioner then had to establish the man's identity, and that often meant uh, uh, getting someone in the colony to travel to the man's home village, show his photograph around, try to establish that he really was from who he said he was. Uh, so uh, if, if that uh, came out positively, and of course you can imagine the longer a man had been away, the harder it was to do this. Um, if satisfied about the uh, application's bona fides, then the High Commissioner of the Colonial Office sent the certificate to the Home Office. They forwarded it to local police, and then local police administered it. So it was implicitly, of course, criminalizing. People in a uh, police in turn called the man in, um, filled in his physical description, got his signature or thumbprint. If he was illiterate, the vast majority were at least not literate in English. Um, and then he got the certificate, and the duplicate got sent back to the Home Office, and then eventually to the High Commissioner of the Colonial Office. This process could take weeks. A uh, man could be uh, really in desperate straits because he couldn't work. Uh, for weeks or even months, or when they finally got the certificate back to him, they had a hard time tracking him down because, of course, he was a sailor, he might be at sea. And I have two things. This is not the power, this is the not PowerPoint. This is the photograph of a young man uh, who applied for uh, the certificate, and this is a copy of his application. You can see the thumbprint there. Uh, that application survives in part because he was denied. Um, so many of these files, like this one, contained a wealth of, some of them are, don't tell me anything, <laughs> um, but many of them contained extra information, and it's the extra information that uh, helps to understand some of these uh, occupations other than seafaring that men might have been engaged in. Also, it allows partial reconstruction of relations within communities, between them and native Britons. I'll talk less about this today. So it's well to remember that this sample skews towards seafarers. It only contains men who, for one reason or another, thought they needed a credential saying that they could uh, work out of British ports. And as we'll see, um, not all of them actually did want to. <laughs> Uh, be seafarers, but there are other populations, and we're just finding out about those. My colleague David uh, Holland at Sheffield has discovered a completely different population who are not reflected at all in these records of South Asian steel workers working in Sheffield in the 1920s. Uh, and that's a population we had no idea were there until he started looking for them. And his article about this will come out in past and present next year. So look out for that. Um, what was his name? Uh, David Holland. So there were, there were workers in Britain in addition to David Steele workers that wouldn't be covered by these sources 
a rather large category were Indian nannies called ayas, women. So obviously they weren't going to be uh, being part-time sailors, uh, entertainers. Uh, there were some large categories of, uh, of workers that this leaves out. This is the sort of working class men who might have been seafarers or turned to seafaring because it was the type of work they could get. Uh, I must say, though, that Norma Myers, who looked at London's population of color in the Napoleonic period, found a very similar breakdown of occupations. In fact, she entitled one chapter, Servant, Sailor, Soldier, Tailor, Beggar Man, which, except for the soldier and the tailor, pretty much covers uh, this, uh, the occupations that um, men in, in my sample uh, practiced. So of approximately 300 applicants, only about 30 reveal any evidence of other employment. That doesn't mean that these other guys didn't, it's just that there's no trace in their records. It didn't come to the attention of the authorities. So uh, we just don't know, right? Um, but the distribution is fairly consistent with what we already know. So table A, and I should have made a PowerPoint, or at least made handouts and I didn't, so I'll just pass the uh, page of the, of the uh, talk. Uh, table A shows peddling was the most common occupation. 16 out of 30 peddled at one time or another, uh, followed by food and other service occupations, cook, uh, boarding housekeeper, waiter. Um, only five men uh, pursued industrial waged labor at any point, uh, and that I'm, I've put a blue check mark next to those five. Uh, there was a guy who worked for the Mercy Docks and Harbor Board as a fireman, which was an occupation that he probably also did on ships before uh, uh, working for uh, on land. Uh, another guy who worked very, uh, briefly in a sugar factory. Uh, another man who worked in the destructor yard, which is the uh, rubbish. Uh, someone who worked briefly in an iron foundry, and someone who did engineering. So I'll just pass that. Oops, I'm going to read the table. <laughs> Sorry. Um, these won't add up to 30 because some men had more than one, right? Table B, and I'll pass that next, renders all men who presented evidence of employment other than seafaring. And I tried to disaggregate that by place of origin, type of employment, and whether it seemed to be a stopgap employment that he was just taking until he could get a seafaring job, or whether it was relatively permanent employment. And so uh, it's P for permanent and S for stopgap, and I'll pass that as soon as I read. Uh, and again, I'm still trying to work this out. Some scholars, for instance, have asserted that Punjabi Sikhs, mainly from Julundur, worked their passage with the intention of finding jobs ashore in Britain. And they've made a very strong distinction between Punjabis and the other uh, two main groups from South Asia, Mirpuris, uh, and Salatis and said, well, those guys only turned to peddling if they were stuck right between voyages. Um, table B shows that there was actually little occupational specialization by region of origin. Salatis from Assam, Punjabis, and Mirpuris all peddled. Uh, the most evident patterns emerged irrespective of regional origin, pragmatic responses to global economic conditions. Um, when men needed a job, they would take any job they could get, whether it was seafaring or, or on land. And except for two very long-term municipal employees, the guy who worked for the Mercy Docks and Harbor Board and the guy who worked for the Liverpool Destructor Yard, men apparently took wage jobs in factories and mines only as a temporary measure. Not all men who pursued, who left seafaring for jobs ashore did so illicitly. The stereotype that the authorities had and that was sort of present in the literature, I think, um, is that, I'm going way over time. Am I going way over time? I think so. Cut me off when I, <laughs> cut me <laughs> off or something. Um, not, uh, the stereotype is men jumped ship, hid out, and the vast majority of them actually did that. But there were some who actually left seafaring for jobs on shore with, you know, per, with someone's permission anyway. Uh, the, one, the one African in this sample is a guy called Samuel Akiemi Ogumbi. Uh, he's the uh, scion of a prominent Lagos family, Lagos, Nigeria, nephew of the archdeacon. 
and after he served several years as a marine fireman, he took up employment ashore in 1926 for an engineering firm in Bolton and basically became an immigrant. An another uh, such licit uh, 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 transition from ship to shore was a Burmese mess boy called Mon Tun Lang Charlie Ta Tao. Uh, in 1928, he applied formally and received permission to leave his ship and train as a cook in Britain, so he wanted to develop his skills. Another guy, Noah Dean from Kashmir, uh, told uh, Liverpool police in 1931 that uh, he had had several voyages in, in city line vessels, and then in 1922, he was asked by a fellow called Lee Fu, owner of the Asiatic boarding house in Liverpool, uh, to remain in that place and do the cooking for the Indian seamen. Um, if you have a comment, go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, with, so, with the city line's consent, um, uh, Noah Dean left uh, maritime work and went to work in the Asiatic Seamen's Boarding House, specifically, I think, to cook for the Indian seamen. So he applied for a certificate merely as an identity credential, and he had been working on shore for quite a while before he applied for it. So this type of unidirectional and ostensibly finite transition from being a sailor to working on land doesn't, however, appear to have been the most common pattern even though it was the one that the authorities were the most concerned about, afraid of. Many men, in fact, seem to move intermittently in and out of maritime labor and a range of other occupations as opportunity or necessity permitted or dictated. A lot of men went to work ashore as a temporary stopgap, and if you're looking at the table, that's the S. <laughs> Some men took work ashore as a temporary stopgap while seeking maritime labor on British terms, and that is rather than being paid a pittance and having their movements constrained in various other ways as they were if they, if they originally signed on in South Asia or elsewhere. Uh, once they were in Britain, they could go to work uh, relatively unconstrained and even the union even let them join, although the union actually treated them very badly. Uh, so they, they didn't necessarily get union wages, but their wages were still much better than they would have been uh, had they uh, continued in, uh, in colonial terms of service. Uh, for instance, stranded in Liverpool in 1919, after arriving from New York, uh, uh, Abdul Ghani worked in a sugar factory in Liverpool before moving to Fleetwood, Lancashire, where he resumed seafaring, and by 1930, he'd worked steadily for 10 years as a ship's engineer on Fleetwood steam trawlers. So he only worked in the sugar factory just enough to kind of find his feet. Another fellow, Feroz Borhan, possibly more typically, resorted to peddling as a temporary stopgap. Uh, police went looking for him uh, in November 1928 to a seaman's boarding house in the east end of London, and the proprietor, Mr. Nairola, uh, informed uh, the constable that Burhan had departed for the provinces. His actual whereabouts is not known. He was expected back, but he basically needed to do something to make a living while he was waiting for this certificate. Uh, Mr. Nairula thought he would be back at some point. Another fellow, Idris Ali of Assam, kept waiting for a seaman certificate since January 1932 finally returned the following autumn, and this is not that unusual for men to be kept hanging for a very long time. Uh, applied for their certificate in January by the fall, he's in desperate straits, and so he returned to his former lodgings, a boarding house for peddlers, operated by a fellow called Darasat Ali in Poplar, East London, until such time as he is able to obtain employment. Another fellow, Arjun Ali, left a city line ship in 1933 due to conflicts with the Sarang, sold toffee for several months uh, as only as an interim measure while awaiting his seaman certificate. Upon receiving it, he wanted to go to sea. Uh, like Abdul Ghani, Farouz Burhan, Ar Arjun Ali, Idris Ali took work ashore as a short-term stopgap en route to steady maritime employment out of British ports under British conditions of service. Once ashore, however, other men proved reluctant to, turn to, uh, to return to sea. Uh, Umber Ali arrived in Britain in 1925 as a ship's fireman, 
From October to December 1928, he served in the coasting trade, which was uh, somewhat unregulated compared to the transoceanic trade, uh, but subsequently supported himself for three years without recourse to seafaring when questions, I'm quoting, as to what he had been doing during the other part of the time, police reported, Ambarali said he had been selling Indian toffee and scent. Not a very lucrative job, right? Ambarali had also moved around a good deal, uh, from Limehouse to Canning Town, uh, back to Limehouse, ba uh, to Poplar, uh, back to Canning Town. Uh, so obviously looking for a, a, a pitch where he could uh, do best financially. But by May 1925, Umber Ali was back at sea. Other men who turned to peddling more or less permanently included a fellow, M. Mofitz, whose last sea voyage ended in 1928 and by 1932 has for some time been working as a peddler. Sidak Ali, too, hadn't been to sea for over two years uh, by 1932, but rather peddling. Uh, Punjabi Shir Khan uh, supported himself in London between 1924 and 1927 by selling toffee on behalf of and while lodging with one Suju Khan, whose address he could not recall when questioned by police, <laughs> uh, and also dealing in hosiery. Uh, Fateh Mohammed, a uh, Kashmiri, first arrived in Cardiff in 1928 as a mariner, uh, but by June 1934 made his living by peddling. Another Kashmiri, Lada Khan, resorted a Greek ship in 1929 uh, and became a peddler in and about the metropolis, London, uh, at least until 1934. A third Kashmiri, Muhammad Ali, deserted a city line vessel in Glasgow in 1929, moving to Falkirk, also in Scotland, where he became a peddler and so remained in May 1934. All of these men apparently used the single voyage from India as a means to gain access to the British or European labor market where they left seafaring for good. Um, now, the Aliens, uh, Aliens Order of 1920, Article 14, exempted Kashmiris uh, as Indian state subjects from registration as aliens if they were employed ashore. And so this might explain why Kashmiris thought that this was a good idea but, of course, not all peddlers were Kashmiris, as, as Table B shows us. Some men flatly rejected further sea service. Abbas Muhammad, a marine document from Mural Pindi uh, in Punjab, told Brighton police in summer 1925 that although he was registered under the recently promulgated Colored Alien Seaman Order, he has now given up that situation and is at present obtaining a livelihood as a peddler in silks, shawls, and embroidered goods in partnership with his brother. Perhaps his wartime experience of being torpedoed not once but twice influenced his enthusiasm for life at sea. Ha Hazam or Hussein Ali, convicted in 1931 at Highgate Petty Sessions of being a peddler wandering about and trading without a license, crime, had arrived in Britain in March 1930, or perhaps October 1929. Um, at the time he was apprehended, Ali resided at 16 Elder Street, which, as we know, is a peddler's boarding house. Reported P.C. Bateson of the Metropolitan Police, he has for some time been standing in street markets and peddling with soap, scent, etc. Although he had arrived by ship, after his release from seven days at hard labor, which was the penalty for peddling without a license, Hussein uh, uh, appeared disinclined to return to seafaring. And the Home Office, of course, are frustrated by this because they think any man uh, from the colonies ought to be leaving by ship and not coming back. Right? Wrote Home Office staff in exasperation, the acquaintance of some of these Lascar deserters with the sea seems to be restricted to a single journey to the UK with the intention of desertion on arrival for the purpose of settling down here as peddlers and the like. Um, you should call time on me or give me... Right, then you've got another 25 minutes. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I know we started late and I don't remember when we started. So as the Home Office suspected, as they complained that uh, these guys were really just uh, getting on a ship so they could get to Britain, some men did apparently use voyages from the colony simply as a means of transport, giving them access to the British labor market. Chowdhury Daru, a Kashmiri, worked his passage from India on a Dutch steamer in 1927, but deserted in London, becoming a peddler, remaining so five years later. Um, Jaifar Ullah uh, from Assam, 
deserted the SS Clan Graham in London in June 1932, states quite frankly, the police reported, that he has no present intention of returning to sea, but will apply for a peddler certificate as soon as he gets his certificate of nationality. And that's kind of a contradiction. Cer certificate of nationality is supposed to enable guys to be a sailor. <laughs> but in fact, as soon as he gets that to prove that he's British, he's going to apply for a peddler's license. Tried in Old Street Police Court for peddling without a certificate in spring 1931, a charge that was dismissed by the magistrate. Local magistrates often didn't want to enforce some of these restrictions because they'd say this man is self-evidently a colonial subject and therefore he's British. Stop harassing him. Um, so the uh, charge, uh, charge was dismissed by the magistrate, but Mufis Ali, although he arrived in Britain as a ship's fireman, hadn't been to sea uh, since May 1930, and he had apparently, and I'm quoting, joined the ranks of the numerous street traders and peddlers. In 1934, the chief constable of South Shields asserted, it is suspected of another man that he is simply engaged as a member of a crew with the intention of deserting on arrival in this country and then becoming a peddler or obtaining other work ashore. The prevalence of peddling, by the way, as the recourse of so many South Asians, raises the question as to whether such men rightfully belonged in ships as the British thought, or whether in fact they were extending South Asian trading networks to the metropole. And I am, I, I, I haven't found any evidence of that, that these are actually part of uh, South Asian trading networks, but I'd like to. <laughs> Um, Jamshid Ali of Assam, for instance, deserted a city line vessel in 1931, took lodgings at 16 Elder Street, the uh, peddler's boarding house, Ula Rasid's boarding house. Um, by December, he was found uh, at another uh, address in Brick Lane, destitute and dependent on the good nature of his compatriots for food and lodging, which happened often. And these uh, networks seem to, in fact, be networks of mutual assistance. Again, as like many immigrants, um, these guys would support each other through periods of unemployment uh, because they weren't entitled to, very often they weren't entitled to any kind of assistance from uh, uh, the state, any kind of relief from the state. And that, too, was a big controversy, whether or not they were. Uh, by December, uh, he's destitute in Brick Lane, Lacking documents, he has made no attempt to assume, resume a seafaring life, and police had little doubt that he will do his best to establish himself in this country. He apparently told police, and I'm quoting, he has no intention of resuming seafaring, but intends to get employment as a restaurant cook or waiter. In the meantime, Ali had apparently been living, making ends meet by street trading in Indian toffee. Shifting from sea to shore, and aspiring to move from peddling to food service, Jamshid Ali apparently at least imagined, realistically imagined, a relatively permanent working life ashore. For the present, however, he, like many others, remained a peddler. Most men, however, were, I don't think, were intending to settle permanently. They vacillated between maritime labor and other work, responding to interwar economic instability by interspersing uh, maritime labor with work ashore. Subkana Dean, also known as Saffron Dean, uh, arrived in Britain in 1920 and journeyed to Schatz in Scotland uh, to work in an iron foundry while lodging at, uh, well, the documents say Gilbert House, but I think there was a, there was a lodging house called Gilburn House uh, that apparently lodged specifically Indian seamen who worked in this iron foundry. Uh, between August 1923 and November 1928, Dean returned to sea as a fireman, but he was stranded in Cuba and sent back to Britain in November 1928. The Cubans thought he was British, right? Unable to obtain further maritime work due to this broken voyage on his record, Dean applied for and received a peddler's license in January 1930. Still, uh, the authorities reported he has done little or no business in that line, that is peddling, uh, as he continued to profess a preference for seafaring. So in other words, he applied for a peddler's license as a stopgap, but he really didn't want to be a peddler. He really wanted to go back to sea. Other men's work histories likewise appeared shaped by fluctuations in the labor market. Mufas Ali, like many others, appeared to be responding to discontinuities in the availability of maritime employment. He arrived in Britain as a ship's fireman, 
and duly registered as a colored alien seaman in October 1928, despite authorities' admission that originating in either, either Calcutta or Silet, he must be a British subject. Yet Mufess Ali left seafaring in May 1930, the trough of global depression, right? Supporting himself as a peddler until January 1934 when he returned to sea. Punjabi Ahmad Khan followed an almost identical traje trajectory. Khan arrived in Liverpool in 1929 on a Dutch ship, but immediately took up peddling, which he practiced continuously until February 1934 when he, re he returned to sea. So even many men with extensive periods working ashore thus returned to seafaring in the mid-1930s when economic recovery improved prospects of maritime employment. Um, then there's, uh, so there's mobility in, in and out of maritime employment and, 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 and employment ashore. There's also geographic mo mobility, and, and men also seem to try to maximize their chances of survival by moving from place to place. Mukoram Khan's travels typified many men who shifted not only from seafaring to other occupations, but from town to town to make ends meet. A native of Northwest Frontier Province, Khan applied for a special certificate in 1929-30 in order to regularize his status in Britain. Although his application originated in Wales, uh, Cardiff, by the time the credential arrived, Mukoram Khan was at sea. By summer 1930, he had apparently left the sea, contacting police in July from an address in Smithfield Road, Gladless, which is in rural Yorkshire, near, near Sheffield. Just a week or so later, he was in Chesterfield, Derbyshire. So seems seems like the, the pattern of a traveling peddler, although I, I, the, the evidence does not uh, stretch. This pattern of mobility among inland towns suggests McCorm Khan sought and found some other means of survival uh, when seafaring work became slack. Ladifor Rahman, too, left a ship in Glasgow in June 1930 and by July 1931 was believed to be traveling the markets in the vicinity of Manchester selling clothing. September found him en route to Wales. And by the way, this guy really made the police mad because he got married and then he and his wife lived for a while under his pseudonyms and uh, he really got away from them. They were frustrated, couldn't find him in Wales. Muhammad Ali deserted a city line ship in Glasgow in 1929, became a peddler, residing with Mrs. Black in Falkirk, Stirlingshire, Scotland. Uh, he apparently moved from Falkirk to South Shields uh, in 1934 after living in Falkirk for five years, from there to an address in Whitechapel. Other men ranged further. For instance, Saffron Dean to the continent, if you remember. Several, if you remember, arrived on Dutch, Greek, or German ships. So the time they spent in Britain uh, is really just a piece of a larger uh, employment history that was global, right, in scope. Somebody came from New York, somebody got stranded in Cuba. Uh, for some men, in fact, it was seafaring itself that seemingly proved the stopgap when opportunities ashore failed or failed to yield a subsistence. Darasad Ali, uh, although operating a lodging house for Indian peddlers in Poplar, petitioned successfully for a seaman certificate after being turned, turned down for a peddler's license. Uh, as he explained, although I am owner of a house, what money I get from house is just rent money as I have no penny profit in house. Further, my unemployment has been stopped, apparently leaving him in need of supplementary income which he s hoped to derive from seafaring. Umar Khan, originally from Assam, told police he wants to go to sea or get a license to sell goods, clearly indicating his openness to either type of work. His residence, however, distant from London's maritime districts, instead near Tottenham Court Road, uh, suggests at best a half-hearted commitment to the sea because you really have to live near the docks if you're going to be a sailor, right? The High Commissioner's Office themselves admitted that by the 1930s, and I'm quoting, it would probably be very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish clearly between seamen and non-seamen. The dividing line may be very thin because the slump in shipping and the consequent shortage of sea employment has driven, driven some, at least, of the men temporarily into other occupations, such as peddling. On the other hand, some men 
seem to have simply, like Noah Dean, applied for this credential because they needed some kind of credential. In the course of the late 20s and early 30s, um, the authorities almost completely suspended giving passports to colonial subjects, and so they would have to apply for this seaman's credential to have any credential at all. Uh, for example, ben, uh, a Bengali called Sashananda Dutt lived at 8 Southampton Street, W1, in the West End of London. He worked as, as a cook for the Indian YMCA in nearby Gower Street, but he still applied for and received a seaman's certificate in 1930. Uh, to Home Office annoyance, Abdul Aziz, although granted his certificate in 1932 by the High Commissioner, and I'm quoting, had not been to sea since 1916. So he had been practicing some kind of, a, of work ashore since 1916. Only in 1932 does he apply for the seaman certificate. Probably not because he wants to go to sea, it's because he needs some kind of credential. Uh, he, was, he is the guy who's working for the Mersey Docks and Harbor Board. For such men, a seaman's certificate provided a measure of security against harassment or exclusion, as well as a fallback should current employment fail, and in a couple of cases, it did fail for one reason or another. Such appeared Punjabi John Muhammad, also known as Muhammad Ali John, a very colorful character, torpedoed during the war, who returned to India as a passenger in 1919, possibly caught up in the repatriation schemes of, uh, of that year. Later in 1919, John Muhammad sailed from Bombay to the United States, where he worked in Detroit as a laborer until October 1923, when he was stripped of US citizenship due to a Supreme Court ruling against non-Caucasians or Orientals. After several attempts to re-enter Britain and obtain credentials, he applied in December 1929 for a certificate of nationality, stating he needed it to sell silk in Belgium. Well, why would you need a semen certificate to sell silk in Belgium? While John Muhammad obviously had abundant experience at sea, he had found a variety of alternative ways to support himself in Britain, the US, and elsewhere. He only applied for a semen certificate when frustrated at getting a more appropriate credential. Another Bengal, another guy, a lot of for a rock run from Bengal. Can, oh, and this is. Uh, John Muhammad's certificate. That's the one we used for the poster announcing tonight's session. Right, right. yeah. So, Latfor Rachman from Bengal, conversely, evaded efforts to repatriate him as a Lascar deserter, in part due to his possession of alternative credentials, in Rachman's case, a peddler's license. Rachman stated that he had been employed as a messroom boy on the Henderson ship Daga, but left the ship in Glasgow in June. 1930, owing to ill treatment by the other mess room steward. He received a peddler's certificate from Glasgow police in July 1930, partly on the strength of holding a similar document for Dublin. In fact, the Home Office were aware that Indian seamen did not necessarily remain seafarers once in Britain, but rather, I'm quoting, setting up in petty trade, peddlers and the like in the metropolis and other towns in the UK. Home Office staff commented in 1934 that it was, I'm quoting, common knowledge that many of these Indians are not seamen as commonly understood. If a man has been peddling in the UK for five years, it is absurd to regard um, such a man as a potential seaman. Their consequent conclusion that seamen's credentials were unnecessary for men now employed ashore reflected incomprehension of insensitivity to their varied and makeshift survival strategies wrote a home office functionary. If an applicant for one of these special certificates is not continuing in sea service and appears to be contemplating settling down ashore as a peddler, there is no question of their being called upon to register under the colored alien seaman order, which is not true. Um, and the purpose for which these special certificates was intended does not arise. For this reason, they denied Kashmiri Muhammad Zaman registration under the colored alien seaman order. I doubt they wrote, if that will worry him, as seafaring is not apparently his occupation or desire. Zaman, in fact, appears to have used waged work ashore to build capital for petty enterprise. Zaman signed on the SS city of Lahore in Bombay as a coal trimmer, leaving the ship in Glasgow in June 1929. He, uh, abandoning his Board of Trade seaman's certificate, his seaman's credential, aboard ship 
rather clearly betrayed his intention to leave seafaring permanently and seek employment ashore, since he would have needed that credential to get a job. He told police he used the voyage from Bombay to Glasgow as a means of migrating, and that, I'm quoting, it is Amman's desire to remain in this country to earn a livelihood by acting as a peddler, unquote. Zaman, like Arjun Ali, appears to have taken waged work in an ironworks, also in Schatz, uh, Scotland, only long enough to make a transition to peddling. Like Muhammad Zaman, other men appear to have entered wage work ashore as a means to finance a transition into self-employment. Amir Ali arrived in Britain in 1922 as a marine fireman on a foreign ship of which he is unable to give any particulars. And a lot of times guys didn't remember what ship they came off of, which frustrated the authorities. Sometimes the authorities thought they were fibbing. Um, but in any case, uh, he arrived by ship as a, as a mariner in 1922. And between 1922 and 27, he worked in Glasgow herring factories, uh, perhaps building up capital, and then became a peddler. Amir Ali explained, I have, been, I have been a seafaring man whenever I get the chance, but I am a peddler to keep my living for time being, as the shipping is very bad. But actually, he'd been a peddler for a long time, right? By 1933, I am peddling above six years. Yet, by 1934, Amir Ali, like others, returned to sea, reporting that his peddling business had declined, and owing to a lack of business, he now desires to take up sea employment. Not all such enterprises remain small in scale. Galaldin Bascon, subject of an Indian native state, left the sea in 1929, settling ashore, marrying, and obtaining a peddler's license in Liverpool, which business he carries on as opportunity affords. Galaldin's main enterprise, however, was a refreshment house at 131 Park Lane in Liverpool's southern docks, for which, in 1932, he pursued a boarding house license. Galaldin and other men discussed here were not anomalies, but took part in a growing phenomenon. In April 1931, uh, P.C. Bateson again reported that Asian ex-seafarers, and I'm quoting, were gradually spreading all over the East End and elsewhere, setting up low-class lodging houses and, or and dealing in silk goods, either by peddling or street trading. The trade had grown to such a degree that there were now in the east end of London, um, I'm sorry, uh, Indians who act as wholesalers to their retailing compatriots. So there's actually an in infrastructure, a wholesale infrastructure developing from which these peddlers would then get credit. Coupled with the institutional infrastructure of boarding houses, such as 16 Elder Street, that was a, not a seaman's boarding house, but a boarding house specifically for men who weren't seamen, uh, this evidence shows that while a stopgap measure for some relatively permanent work ashore remained an aspiration for many colonized seafarers and a realistic one for some. Then there's illicit activity. <laughs> Makeshift strategies have been understood as involving an array of subsistence activities, not all necessarily licit. Judging legal. Judging by the fragmentary evidence some men provided about their methods of survival, some may not have been entirely above board. Punjabi Ali Qadir had lived ashore for several years through means he appeared reluctant to share with police. When questioned, John Muhammad, Two, declined to say how he had supported himself during the time he had already spent in Britain. John Muhammad, like Ali Qadir, made ends meet through a combination of legitimate and possibly illicit practices. Well, the most colorful case of this is um, Abdul Hamid, a Bengali, uh, who had the misfortune one Sunday evening in November 1931 of encountering Police Sergeant McClelland in Queen's Dock Avenue, Liverpool, after visiting friends on a Klan line vessel. Sergeant McClellan searched uh, Abdul Hamid, finding a tin box in his waistcoat pocket containing six pellets of a brown substance, of which Abdul Hamid claimed ignorance. During his interrogation at Special Branch, Sergeant Lawson identified the contraband as Cheris, uh, which contained Indian hemp and I'm quoting here, the excessive smoking of which incites a person to commit acts of violence. Sergeant Lawson learned that Hamid had applied for a seaman certificate the previous February. This is now November, right? Um, 
But police had been unable to locate him in May when it arrived, and it's not clear that they were looking very hard. Denied recourse to seafaring by autumn, Hamid found himself in desperate straits. Uh, Haas, uh, Lawson hypothesized that since Cheris, all, and by the way, I don't know how to pronounce that. My computer said Cheris, but that just sounds really unlikely. But anyway, Cheris, also known as Hashish, uh, was legal in India and prevalent on Indian man ships. Lawson hypothesized that friends that Abdul Hamid had visited that evening had maybe given him just a little bit to sell so he could find a bed for the night and something to eat. Right? Lawson estimated the street value of, 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 the, of the hash at three shillings. That's not a professional trafficker. For Abdul Hamid, selling, selling cherries formed only one of a disparate array of subsistence activities, most of them legal, but none very lucrative or secure. He had worked in seamen's boarding houses as a cook in London, Cardiff, and other seaports, and for a long time as a peddler in and around Manchester. He produced a peddler's license uh, dated February 1931. He also sold toffee for two years, worked at a Blackpool showground uh, during the previous summer. After that, he had assisted the cook at the Ellerman City Line's Asiatic Seamen's Boarding House in 34 Great George Street, Liverpool, in exchange for bed and board. A falling out with this man had put Hamid on the streets. Contacted due to Abdul Hamid's Manchester peddler's license, police there said he had not actually peddled, and it is not known how he obtained his livelihood. Released in January 1932 from Her Majesty's prison after two months hard labor, not 25 years, Abdul Hamid returned to peddling toffee in the streets of Liverpool and Hull, still awaiting his semen certificate. Uh, reported police, when Hamid can get money for sugar, he makes toffee, which he sells in the street. Although destitute, Abdul Hamid declines to return to India. For the unfortunate Abdul Hamid, selling cherries formed part of a makeshift strategy enabling him to just barely survive ashore in Britain. Um, more seriously, police suspected another guy, Ali Natha. They suspected everybody, right? <laughs> They're police. So, but they suspected a guy called Ali Natha, a native of Karachi, of subsisting from distinctly unsavory practices. He was a ship's cook until June 1931, but more recently he had become an agent for a guy called Peter Rossi, a person who, whose business was cashing Siemens advance notes. This enterprise often involved exploitative commissions, and uh, although um, a searching inquiry had in fact turned up no, no illegality, uh, the police, Swansea police persisted in, in suspecting Natha, and I'm quoting, frequently takes advantage of his fellow countrymen's ignorance to his own personal gain. In other words, he was clever, and so he must be up to no good. For the most part, however, colonized workers in Britain resorted to a varied range of mostly legal occupations, principally petty trade. Now, there was one guy who actually went from an occupation on shore to an occupation at sea, and I don't know what to do with him, but he's there, so. Uh, most men sh sought jobs ashore as an alternative to seafaring. A guy called Mohammed Akram made the most unlikely transition from the Afghan diplomatic corps to maritime labor. Between his arrival in March 1928 as secretary to the Afghan legation in autumn of that year, Mohammed Akram Khan applied for and obtained a seaman certificate and moved his residence from Prince's Gate in the West End to uh, 49 High Street Poplar and then to Price Street in Liverpool, both seamen's boarding houses. So what can we conclude from this? Uh, I hope you'll help me. <laughs> Carolyn Bressy has written about the difficulty of finding people of color in colorblind historical source materials, although she's also doing a wonderful job of finding them anyway. I recommend her work highly. Although colonized people inhabited or passed through Britain for centuries as servants, entertainers, dignitaries, and students, their very, the very flexibility and mobility of this interwar population and, uh, and their working class uh, status has obscured the fact that they were even there. The applications for the Certificate of Nationality, while recondite and opaque in some respects, 
nonetheless offer insight into how colonized subjects survived in the adverse labor market of interwar Britain. By the 1920s, colonial subjects of diverse origins lived and worked in Britain. And this is pushing, along with David Holland's work, uh, pushing the uh, boundary of the formation of Britain's communities of color back before the Second World War. I'm not the only person. Uh, a number of us are working on that project. Uh, so already by the 1920s, colonial subjects of diverse origins lived and worked in Britain. They labored in a broad range of jobs, albeit mainly marginal ones, and their survival strategies involved geographical and occupational flexibility. While some men worked ashore because stranded between sea voyages, as some scholars have suggested, others apparently traveled to Britain intending to seek work on shore and possibly even to settle. The analysis shows that men moved purposefully among jobs and locales in response to opportunities or setbacks. While British authorities feared unidirectional and finite migration from colonies to Britain, the stories of Rasid Ullah, Amir Ali, Saffron Dean, show colonized men circulated into and out of the British labor market for a variety of reasons and with differing goals. They sought not simply survival, but mobility and freedom from colonial constraints and super-exploitation. Okay.